The following show is brought to you in partnership with the Institute of Politics, Policy, and History, Blue Star Strategies, Bright Road Incorporated, Make It Plain Podcast, and RPC Media. campus of the University of the District of Columbia. This is State of Play. Welcome to State of Play. I'm Sharon Pratt and with me is Karen Tramontano and also the Reverend Mark Thompson. Our topic today, the census, highly charged topic of the census. And with us is Dr. Margot Anderson. She's the Distinguished Professor Emerita in History and Urban Studies at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you. Now, I think you're in a class all your own. I think you are probably the leading expert on this topic, at least in terms of the social history of the census in America. Now, why was it with a brand new country did the founding fathers become so concerned with having this process? Was it driven by example, or was it driven by a philosophy that it would be in the first article of the Constitution? Okay, this is this will take us back to the 1780s, you know, 20 years after the revolution, the American Revolution. And the, so the country is one, the United States is one, but the government is very fragile. And uh, so the, the, they were having trouble raising revenue. Um, there was unrest breaking out and a, con a uh, convention was called for Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 to what to do about this. It is in that those series of meetings in the summer of 1787 that they write the constitution. What they were concerned about was the fact that the, you had 13 individual colonies, now states, who had never really interacted with one another. They had reinteracted with the crown. The government that was set up to win the Revolutionary War was basically a, a Congress and an army. So no administrative branch, no tax raising capacities. And so the fragility of the infant United States was, was what drove them into a room to, to come up with a solution uh, and the problems were many. How do we raise revenue? How do we balance big states, small states, slave states, free states, different religious traditions? And that's what the, um, the language of Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 3 is all about. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned according to their respective numbers. They decide that population count will be the um, mechanism by which they are going to solve this problem. So in the in the beginning, though, uh, the intention was to basically count uh, those who were of European descent, I gather, because they did not even want to count Native Americans. It was a deal cut to accommodate the southern states with slaves to make certain they could count the slaves, but not a full person, three fifths. Is, the, okay. is that right? Yeah. So the issue at the time was who are the people? You know, if you, the opening line of the constitution is we the people of the United States, who are the people, right? Women, children, slaves, free, indentured servants, uh, uh, Aboriginal Indian populations. And the decision to not count American Indians was based on the notion at the time that they were sovereign nations and therefore not part of the state. The issue on, um, on whether, how to handle what was clearly a problem of slaves actually goes back to 1783. They had solved that problem already in the Congress because they had written a provision in 1783 to allocate tax responsibility among the states using the three-fifths rule. So what they did is they lifted that rule already 
uh, that they'd already developed into the, the, um, the 1787 uh, constitution. Most people don't know that. It wasn't a new idea in 1787. So, Dr. Anderson, you've said that the census um, article is is the least controversial. Um, that seems to have changed. How come? Well, the article was what you had to do at the time. At the time, if you read, say, the Federalist Papers, which are the defense of the Constitution, um, they say, look, you know, we know some of these rules are a little screwy, um, but we need to do something because not doing something is means that we're going to be, the government is going to collapse and the British are going to come back and we don't want that. And there are compromises all the way through the constitution on these matters. They, they also don't know how to do the census yet. They just simply in the constitution simply say, in such manner as they shall by law direct, meaning the Congress. And they, they all, but they do decide that you can't let the states count themselves because they'll um, finagle the numbers. And they also decide that it has to be on a regular um, decennial every 10 year um, provision because they already know that the population is growing very rapidly. So those, um, so the, those are the, the consensus ideas. What then happens in implementation is they, they discover all the new things that they, they didn't understand. So for example, this con uh, constitution is silent on the formula to allocate seats in the House of Representatives. That turned into a crisis in 1792. It, it generated the first presidential veto. So you had a constitutional crisis in the making like, oh, we were able to take the census, but we don't know how to, we don't understand the math to actually um, divvy up the seats. They hadn't decided on how big the house would be. You know, the constitutional uh, um, layout of the, uh, of the house is 65 members. Uh, after the first census, it's 106. So they're constantly changing. And that is true for every census, all 24 of them ever since, is that it's, a, it's always um, a debate. Were we the first to use the census for political apportionment? Not now, but we were then. I mean, the notion that we the people form the government is a radical notion in the 18th century. I mean, we're still talking about a period where most of the world believes in the divine right of kings. <laughs> so the idea that the people had any say in their uh, what went on in their government was a really new, new idea and was untested at the time. Well, we could not have gotten a better person to explain to us such a highly charged, complicated process as the census. Thank you so very much, Dr. Anderson, for being a part of State of Play. Thank you. Welcome back to State of Play. Today, we're talking about the 2020 census the challenges and its importance. And with us is Mr. Atoro Vargas with Naleo Education Fund. Mr. Vargas, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. First, could you explain Naleo's mission? I understand it is focused on the full political participation of Latin Americans, but could you tell us some more? Absolutely. Uh, Naleo stands for the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. We're a membership organization of Latino public servants and our nonprofit arm, the mission is to increase the participation of Latinos in American democracy. So we do that by mobilizing Latinos to participate, become citizens, to vote, uh, to be counted in the census. Once somebody gets elected to office, we provide training so that they can be the most effective public servant possible. And then we promote a policy agenda that makes participation more accessible for Latinos and all Americans. Let me ask you about the 2020 census. In your view, what happened? Is there an undercount? You know, when the numbers uh, came out last week, I was really surprised at how low they were uh, for the national resident population. And really the 2020 census was in the middle of a perfect storm, both in terms of the lack of oversight by Congress and the funding by Congress, to give the Census Bureau adequate time and resources to prepare. The political interference by the Trump administration, everything from trying to add a citizenship question to uh, appointing political 
operatives within the Bureau at the last minute to try to implement the work of the Bureau. And of course, uh, the impact of the pandemic. The question is, how bad is the deferential undercount? The, the difference between the count of white Americans as opposed to Latinos, African-Americans, Asians, immigrants, poor people, young children, the differential undercount is what really matters. So we hear a lot about the political ramifications of the census in terms of redistricting, but what else is at stake? Well, you know, there are three primary uses of the decennial census data. One is political, uh, the apportionment of the U.S. House of Representatives and the subsequent redrawing of electoral districts. So it really is about political power. It's about money. Uh, over a trillion dollars is allocated by the federal government every year to states and localities using census numbers and some kind of formulas. And it's about decision making. Policymakers and foundations and the business community all make decisions based on population data. And if the population numbers are wrong, then your decisions are off. And you may not be making the best decisions about how to serve your constituency. And as we recover from this pandemic, it's absolutely essential that uh, policymakers understand exactly how many people are in this country, where are they, uh, what, are their, what are their needs, and all that comes from the census. Is there anything that can be done? Well, there's nothing really to be, that can be done with regard to the numbers for apportionment or redistricting. But the Census Bureau is going to have several evaluations of the census, including something called demographic analysis and a post enumeration survey that will evaluate the quality of the count. I think if the Bureau determines there was a severe undercount of some populations, it may need to adjust those counts for purposes other than apportionment and redistricting. Thank you very much, Mr. Vargas. Thank you for the information. Thank you. Please don't go away. There's more to State of Play. So welcome back to State of Play as we continue the conversation about the highly charged census process. And with us now is the president and CEO of the National Urban League, also formerly a distinguished mayor of New Orleans. Uh, we are so honored to have with us Mark Morial. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Well, Mayor Pratt, thank you so much. I appreciate your friendship and, uh, and leadership. And it's just great to be with you today to talk about an issue of great importance to the nation uh, and of great importance to Black America. So almost every civil rights organization, every advocacy group, uh, the Urban League, Unidos US, uh, NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, all were terrified of the census process in 2020. How did it turn out? Uh, at this point, uh, I have to tell you, I have great concerns. And it's a concern that there was an undercount. And I'll tell you why. While it's going to take several more months for us to really determine uh, whether there was an undercount, there are a couple of things that uh, lean in, in that direction. Number one is that the census released an account that there were about 331 million Americans. That count deviated from the census's pre-count estimates, which were much, much higher. That's number one. Number two, the Trump administration played games in an effort to undermine and manipulate the census from the very beginning. Number one, they sought to include an ill-advised citizenship question which was designed to intimidate uh, many people from participating in the count. Ultimately, uh, through, uh, uh, through a challenge that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, that effort was thwarted. The census was highly delayed, uh, late in hiring the cadre of people called enumerators who uh, come into neighborhoods and knock on doors and. Uh, check on people who did not fill out the form either online or through the mail. And I think that there were many, many doors in America that were never knocked. Now we were dealing with the pandemic, of course, but uh, there was a safe and socially distanced way for them to do it. Uh, number three, uh, in an ill-advised move, 
uh, after the census was delayed last April and May due to the pandemic and then resumed, we encouraged the census director, Stephen Dillingham, to extend uh, the deadline for the census, which he did. He got his hand slapped and he was ultimately undercut by the White House, which sought uh, to ratchet back and end the census early. We challenged that uh, with a federal lawsuit, which we ultimately secured an injunction, which prevented them from ending the census early. Uh, it wound its way to the Supreme Court and it was ended two weeks early. Our, our injunction bought an additional two, maybe three weeks. All of these factors when taken together on top of the pandemic suggest that the number that they came up with leads, leaves much to be desired. Uh, so I'm not prepared the to be this. this. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm meaning to cut so across. Has, you know, the, the fallout is reapportionment. The fallout is distribution of money pursuant to all those formula programs that send money to cities and states. The fallout is that uh, there will be underrepresentation because of the undercount, because we know that if there's an undercount, it is highly likely that that undercount is of black and brown people. So probably in terms of reapportionment, that's a done deal. I mean, I don't know if you can sue about that, but all the social programs, what are the social programs that are defined by, you know, the census? There's an innumerable number of them. I think uh, about 800 billion, nearly a trillion of all federal programs. That's about a quarter, a little bit less than a quarter of the overall federal budget. Those monies are distributed by way of formulas which are based on information in the census. For example, how many children live in a given state? How many children live in a given city will determine the allocation of Head Start dollars? Uh, how many uh, uh, low-income Americans might live in a particular uh, census tract, which uh, is in a neighborhood in a city, will make a determination as to what the CBDG community development block grant allocation is and so forth and so on. So these, many of these programs, their formulas are data driven. That's good if the data is good. The data is not good. If the data is suppressed, if the data is inadequate, then communities can be harmed. But if I'm a senior living in, on Bourbon Street, right? <laughs> Does it impact my life? I mean, will it, this problem impact my it life? It could impact your life because it could impact, and I'm not uh, readily familiar with what senior programs benefited, but the issue of representation, which you know we've fought for years. Look, the District of Columbia that you ably led uh, is long overdue for statehood. But Thank you. another community, take Virginia or Maryland, take Baltimore, take Richmond, uh, could, because of the undercount, have fewer members because people in that city, predominantly Black city, have been undercounted in the census. So it affects uh, uh, that reapportionment. City council seats in a given city, county commission seats in places where you have judges elected by districts, which we do uh, in Louisiana it could impact all of the above. This is so important that people understand that the census is not a census for just the sake of a count. We need to know how many people live in the United States, but we need to know how many children, how many seniors, how many blacks, how many whites, how many Hispanics. We need to know how many people live in Wyoming versus in Virginia versus Maryland versus Georgia or Texas. And the quality of the data, the the, the, the reliability of the data, the accuracy of the data is what is at stake. Well, I know that Biden has put forward a very aggressive sort of social service type program through his infrastructure bill and the like, sort of a la New Deal. Now, when he pushes out those programs, I assume like Head Start and uh, Meals on Wheels or whatever, all of that is going to be tied to the census numbers. Is there any wiggle room after this problematic census count? You know, we are examining 
all options from things that the president and the Department of Commerce can do uh, to possible, uh, possible litigation. Uh, we are going to do everything possible. Uh, if there's a determination that this count was inadequate and inaccurate and was suppressed, we got to make a distinct, we got to draw a line. Frontline census professionals that work at the Bureau uh, have just been absolutely magnificent in pushing and in wanting a complete and accurate count. Most of these problems emanated from political interference and political decision making, uh, which began at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue under President 45. Uh, and and their, their effort to uh, manipulate political reapportionment through encouraging a depressed count. Well, you know, since the inception of the country, uh, America's always wanted a representative kind of system, except they didn't want to count everybody starting off with three-fifths human being for the enslaved. And that is the challenge, isn't it? So uh, uh, you've got to fight on your hands, do you not, Mr. Mayor? We have a fight, but it's a collective fight, as you mentioned at the top, uh, the civil rights, uh, uh, racial justice and equity uh, community is fairly united. Uh, elected officials across the board are fairly united, uh, who, are, who, are, who are fair minded and thoughtful. Uh, never uh, in, in most recent history has there been an effort to politicize so many things it should not be politicized, and the census is won. Well, as long as you're in the vanguard, as long as you're there fighting the good fight, as Jesse Jackson used to say, we'll keep hope alive. Thank you, Let's Mr. Let's keep Mayor. hope alive. Let's keep the drive alive. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for being on State of Play. Welcome back to State of Play. Our topic today, the census, highly charged, consequential, census. And with us to continue this conversation is Howard Feinberg. He is the co-director of the Census Project and a senior vice president of Insights Association. Thank you so very much for being here. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. I forgot to mention that you are the son of a statistician, so you're quite uh, well prepared for this experience. So you're a part of the Census Project co-director uh, and that includes almost every kind of stakeholder, including the business community, government, civil rights group, as well as the business community. Is that right? Correct. It's a really eclectic coalition, 900 plus uh, state, local, national organizations and companies. And yes, everything from the business community to activists, civil rights community, research and academia, and all manner of the business community. So the business community is involved because they're data points that really, I assume, make it have an impact on business decisions. Could you really highlight two or three ways it really has an impact for businesses and therefore for the consumer? The direct concern for the consumer, it's how a lot of businesses will determine where they're going to set up their next business or if they're going to keep a business in a specific area. And that can be both uh, the, ur the urban core of a large metropolitan area or uh, some small town in a rural remote area of the country. Uh, it allows them to determine, you know, is there a need for uh, a new OBGYN in, in this area? You know, the, what's, the, what's the baby boom looking like and current trends on marriage? Uh, it is determining whether or not you're going to get a, a new Walmart in you know, some rural area that it's been dying for a good opportunity. Uh, and for urban areas, it's going to be not a you know, sighting of a shopping center. Is there a particular need for certain kinds of stores? And is there a workforce that's willing to work there? And then it brings a skill set to make it work, in addition to a demand from the consumers. And really, it comes down to identifying the unmet needs with both within workforce and the unmet needs and wants of consumers. Members of the civil rights community are concerned about the accuracy of the 2020 census. Does the business community have the same concerns? Uh, yes, not for the same reasons. I mean, obviously, so a lot of the concern on the business and civil rights community, uh, sorry, sorry and the, a lot of the concern among the civil rights community, same as among the political class, is focused really on uh, the apportionment of congressional districts and redistricting at various levels because it's the, the distribution of direct political power. 
but the business community is more focused on the, the usefulness of that data and its accuracy for being able to uh, conduct a good survey and be able to fully understand uh, you know, what their consumers are thinking, uh, if there is a base for the next product or service that they're working on, uh, where their workforce is going and where they need to be to be able to hire that workforce. Uh, a lot of the fundamental things that really trickle down and impact an ordinary consumer, it's the same thing that impacts the business. So what you've just described is pretty consequential. Uh, if we didn't get it right, and right now we're functioning on 2010 data, are we stuck for the next 10 years? To a certain extent, uh, yes. I uh, can't, dis can't disagree <laughs> with that. Um, there's a lot of work being done at the moment, both within the Census Bureau and among a variety of outside statistical expert organizations to try to evaluate the quality of that data. So we don't really know where we are in, uh, in terms of how good or how bad it might be. Um, any small uh, discrepancies in accuracy can have a, a large impact over the course of the whole decade, including on, uh, to an individual household. That could be the difference between the place where you live, getting the correct amount of you know, funding for the VA and for transportation, uh, you know, all manner of social welfare programs, education funding, healthcare funding, everything comes back to census data. So it does have an impact all across the decade uh, on the lives of ordinary people and uh, shaken out on the business community as well as we've discussed. Uh, there are ways in which you can supplement that data. Certainly the members like I work with at the Insights Association conduct all forms of research, to try to help you know, really drill down on specific points and specific areas so that businesses can make the right decisions for their needs and for their consumers. Uh, but ultimately, there's only quite so much you can do to make up for bad data from the decennial. You know, the American Community Survey becomes the base for a lot of what businesses do. But you know, usually a couple of years after the decennial data itself uh, has come out and they start to feel, well, it's a little stale and we need, to, we need something that's a, a bit more up to date, even if it's not quite as precise. So there's the count and possibly some argue the undercount, but how about the analytics that goes into that data? Uh, case in point, uh, Prince George's County at one time had one of the highest median incomes in the country, a uh, pretty dense population, and yet they struggled to get a grocery store, struggled to get a department store. Some ascribed it to the census data. Uh, can you help us grasp this and understand this? Uh, yes, armchair statistician, that's who I am. Uh, so a lot of that comes back to, uh, it's more than just the total count of the population there. It's going to be to broader trends. Uh, is the population growing or receding? Um, where is, and what demographic groups is it growing in? And especially, I think a lot, age comes into play a lot. If, you know, if you're growing a young population, uh, that bodes really well for uh, certain kinds of businesses. And the attraction for both having a consumer base and a workforce. Uh, it, there are a lot of different factors and it's more than just the decennial, although certainly it can come into play. If the census is missing even 1% per, perhaps of the population that is actually in Prince George's, that's potentially huge, depending on who it is that you're missing. Because uh, it's not just the, you know, they're less funding than the county might need, at least based on the 2020 data now they are coming soon, but it's also you know, the potential lost investment. Uh, it's businesses relocating from Prince George's somewhere else based on their assumptions made using imperfect data. Well, you know, I, it, you've explained to us why it is so consequential and why so many of those stakeholders became so engaged and so concerned about this process, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, well, we can't really thank you enough for providing this insight and how the census impacts something as basic as a business decision or whether I have a bank that's accessible to me. So thank you so very much for being on State of Play. Thanks for having me.
Welcome back to State of Play. Our topic today, the highly charged process associated with the census. And we have with us now someone who actually was the director of the U.S. Census Bureau. He's now the provost and executive vice president at Georgetown University. So glad to have with us Provost Robert Groves. Thank you for being here. Well, I am delighted to be here. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. Um, so, the census process, you actually administered one uh, in 2010. Uh, I imagine it changed from how it started in 1790, sort of a door to door. How, do, how did you administer it then and how do they administer it now? Yeah, we, we've all just gone through the 2020. The, the 2010 census was slightly different. Most people received in, in the mail a questionnaire, a short questionnaire, and you filled it out and mailed it back. What that means is that you have to go out and visit the households that didn't return that questionnaire, and we did so. Uh, in 2010, that meant that we hired about 600,000 of our fellow residents who knocked on doors of the households that didn't return the questionnaire and asked questions in a face-to-face -face mode. And then the data were assembled and processed basically like 2020. 2020, as we know, started off not with a mail questionnaire, but rather with a link uh, to a web questionnaire. And we did everything online. And, and that worked pretty well, by the way. Unofficial, I'd say projections, well, well over 350 million Americans. We ended up with something like, what, 331 million. Should we be concerned about that disparity, especially since we're in the throes of a pandemic? That alone doesn't uh, disturb most of us who I think watch these data pretty carefully. We know that the growth of the population has been slowing for multiple reasons. One is lower fertility. We're having fewer babies, uh, but also the uh, impact of lower immigration into the country and changes in immigration, the exits. Hitting that number, uh, predicting that final census count is a tough thing to do in any circumstance. The impact of COVID on all these numbers is something that we are now investigating as a statistical community very carefully. So eventually we'll get some answers to that question too early to know now. So some communities, in particular black and brown communities, feel that they were undercounted in 2020. Are these concerns valid or is it too early to tell? Well, there's some very predictable uh, facets of undercounting in every census around the world. To, to the surprise of many, babies and young children tend to be missed in censuses worldwide. We think it has to do with just a misperception in people's mind of what a census is about. And they think, gee, they must be interested only in adults. Uh, the other challenging populations are those that are transient, moving across households or dwelling places. Uh, so these tend to be younger people, they tend to be poorer people. And then finally, a special population this decade are college students in dormitories. And there's always a confusion of whether their parents should count them at home or count them in the dorms. They should be counted in the dorms. But recall that COVID hit and sent a whole bunch of college kids uh, back to their uh, residences at that time. Now, some of these attributes are correlated with race and ethnicity. So new immigrant groups, poor populations that tend to be people of color tend to be undercounted in almost every country in the world. So Biden has a lot of aggressive social programs and major initiatives are almost like the New Deal. They inevitably are tied to this count based upon the census. Is he stuck with these numbers? Is there any wiggle room? What does he do? So I don't think we know enough yet. We, we have the state level uh, counts now. That's very useful, important, crucial for, for apportionment. But we don't have the lower level data. So too soon to tell. Secondly, I urge all of us to, to watch the examination that's going on independently and within the Census Bureau 
on the quality of these data. When we have both accounts and estimates of, of quality, then I think uh, uh, the decision of may I use these data wisely for my particular purpose can be answered with more certainty. So has there ever been a time when the quality of the data was um, so suspect that the census was rejected? So I don't know of a case where quality was the driver, but there's a fascinating historical occurrence in 1920 when the 1920 census showed massive migration from rural areas to urban areas. So there through redistricting would be a shift of power, urban, rural. And in a prior set of acts, the Congress for the first time limited the count in the House to 435. Those two facts uh, stymied the Congress from reapportioning itself. For 10 years, it was not until the 1930 census that the 1910 uh, districts were, were changed through a law in 1929. I don't view that as a quality metric, but it's a fascinating precedent for the House rejecting it for reapportionment purposes. It sounds like a political rejection nonetheless, because though that shift would have political implications and so if in fact people are concerned about whether there was intentional undercounting in 2020, uh, could you have that same kind of response, political response to accommodate it? Or would you end up in the courts? So what could happen? Yeah, I, I think we all think we're in unprecedented times, right? We've never done a census in the pandemic uh, that we've, we're, we're still experiencing, right? There, none of the old, uh, assumptions, I think, apply. When uses of the census are challenged by one group or another, in prior decades, the courts uh, have intervened uh, to, to try to adjudicate whether a particular use of the data uh, fits the quality of, of the data being used. Now, statistical sampling plays a role in the census. Could you explain uh, what role it plays, what purpose statistical sampling has? Yeah, by statistical sampling, most people mean that instead of constructing statistics that are solely, or aggregates, if you will, solely the function of uh, uh, enumeration, actual enumeration one by one, we use estimation techniques, looking at the patterns of, of data and try to improve the quality of the counts that way. In a Supreme Court case at the end of the 90s, use of such procedures for reapportionment was banned as unconstitutional. Use of such procedures in other uh, domains was not explicitly banned and they're being used for different purposes. So statistically, if you have external data that can improve the actual counts, many statisticians would say, gee, we ought to use that, but we have this prohibition at the highest level. Well, we're almost out of time, but I'd love to drill down further with you on that one because almost all algorithms have some judgment as we see with artificial intelligence and facial recognition. So wouldn't it have it, can you say, would it have an impact here? It could. And I think uh, in a democracy, if there are such a, adjustments, the adjustments themselves must be transparently and clearly communicated. And when good statistics are transparently communicated and debated, then, then we do well as a society. Well, Provost Groves, you've been terrific. Uh, you can actually explain it as someone who actually did it. So we can't thank you enough for participating and enlightening us here on State of Play. Well, it was great fun, and thank you so much for having me. Welcome back to State of Play. Karen, Mark, and I have been educated 
just around the census process, why it is so highly charged, why it's so consequential. Uh, Professor Anderson explained how the census began back in 1790, the first count. And in America, it was the first place to really tie the individual count to the political process. Vargas and Morial explained why communities of color were desperately concerned that this process in the middle of a pandemic would result in an undercount for people of color. Uh, then Feinberg explained how this data really is relevant to decisions in business in terms of whether you will ever see a grocery store in your neighborhood or a bank in your neighborhood. And then Groves explained exactly how the Census Bureau functions and what they do with that data and if there's any concerns about that data. It has been a real education and we understood and understand why people of color in particular, and especially those to the left, were concerned about this census. And I think the Democrats came away feeling a little had by the process. Well, you know, Mayor, I'm not sure uh, that the Democrats are drawing the right conclusions from this, or frankly, the media is drawing the right conclusions, uh, because it's very easy to say all is good with the Republicans because of this apportionment and all's bad with the Democrats. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. We've got 25 states that have independent commissions, a few more states that have commissions that make recommendations. And in, in some of those states like Michigan uh, and Colorado and even Montana, so it's not, uh, let's just say it's not all black and white. Mm -hmm. I think you both are right, Mayor, in the sense that you know, we know we were, uh, as people of color in many respects, undercounted, and we know that was the plan. The Trump administration wanted to prevent apportionment from benefiting us, and even some of the very resources. A lot of people don't realize what the census does do in terms of what you get in your community, in terms of schools, in terms of economics, all of that. So that's one part of it. Karen is right, too, though, because what we know is that even though the there was an increase in the non-educated white voters in the last elections, there was also an increase in some voters of color, Asian-Americans, Latinos, African-Americans pretty much broke even, which is somewhat surprising. So we, we're going to have a problem and we have to see what's going to happen if there's increased voting amongst people of color while the census is returning numbers saying that we weren't all counted. But hopefully there's a way to resolve all of this. I think Karen's right, too. It's complicated. It's going to be a complicated process. But that is the cog that the Trump administration obviously and willingly put in the wheel. No question about it. And uh, that was quite intentional. And I think our country's always had that conflict around uh, this process of counting every human being because the notion was you count everybody for purposes of political power, you know, who, what states get greater power. And that conflict existed even at the beginning uh, where you're going to count everybody, but when it got to the enslaved people, it was three-fifths a human being because they didn't want the Southerners to have the benefit of that population, a population that they really treated as property. But at any rate, we've all been educated, we've been better informed, and we understand why this process matters and why we need to stay with it. So I'm glad we had a lively conversation and an education here on State of Play.